want you to turn in your Bible over to John 3.16, good place to start today. The salvation God provides, I was, doesn't happen to me a lot. I was deeply grieved this last week when I watched a video of a pastor, local pastor, preaching a false grace and works gospel. And he was mixing grace and works for salvation, believing that you, you're not only saved by God's grace, but you also have to have uh, works and, and a certain self-reformation and so forth if you're going to get it to heaven, and, and also you need to follow Christ as well. At best, he was confused. At worst, he was lost. And I can't judge whether he's lost or not. That's between him and God. I hope he's saved. But his message would not save that he was preaching, and yet he had a church full of people who were believing what he was saying and amening him. He's leading a church, and people were believing what he said because why wouldn't they? He's the pastor. Right? You ought to be able to trust your pastor. He's speaking for God, so to speak. You should be able to trust the one in the pulpit, okay? Let me say this. I take my pulpit ministry very seriously. I understand, folks, I'm going to give an account to God one day for what I say, all right? And I take that seriously, and I want to be accurate, and I want to be true. And if there's anything I know that is true, it is what I'm going to be sharing during this series, and what I'm going to be sharing with you today. If I don't, if what I'm telling you is not the truth, I need to get out of the pulpit because I've been deceived for over 50 years. But what I'm telling you is the truth. And it is worth living for and it is worth dying for. And so we need to understand that. There is no issue that is more important in the entire world for us to have right because it will determine where you are going to spend forever. And that is a serious deal. Once a person has died, it is too late for him to change his mind. And there are no second chances. That is the truth. And that is where we stand. When you have a true understanding of salvation, it will ground you spiritually and it will give you an understanding of what God wants to do in your life. Nothing more important for you to understand. Now, why are we covering this? You might say, Pastor, we cover salvation on a regular basis. We do. Well, one reason, because we do need to keep hearing it. I love to tell the story to those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. But you know what, folks? And I'm glad to say, and praise the Lord for this, we have many new people coming to our church. And maybe you've never learned these things. And that's not a slam on you. It's love for you that we are covering this. Because we want you to be blessed like we have been blessed. And so that is why we are doing this. Now let us just jump right into our study. What is salvation? That's a profound question. What is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? To be religious is not the same as being saved. I was religious for 19 years of my life, and I was, as they say in the South, I was as lost as a ball in high weeds. Okay? What does it mean to be saved? The answers to our question must begin with that issue. The, the verb save, to save, okay, uh, the word save means in its simplest form to deliver, to deliver. As a noun, salvation means deliverance. The old Schofield Reference Bible, which we sell in our resource center and which some of you I know use, uh, it states this, quote, the Hebrew and Greek words for salvation imply the ideas of deliverance, Safety, preservation, healing, 
soundness. Salvation is the great inclusive word of the gospel, gathering into itself all the redemptive acts and processes as justification, redemption, grace, propitiation, imputation, forgiveness, sanctification, glorification. They're all in salvation. No wonder the writer of Hebrews says it's so great a salvation. It is a great thing. Now, don't be afraid of those big words, okay? Uh, Some of them we will define as the series goes on. When we think of the issue of becoming a Christian, we are talking about salvation or deliverance from sin and its penalty of death and eternal damnation. This is a serious issue. It is being saved, okay, when we talk about salvation, becoming a Christian, it is being saved from conscious torment in a literal hell for all eternity. But not only is it being saved from a literal hell for all eternity, it is also being saved to an eternity with God forever in heaven. So it's a glorious thing. It is receiving everlasting life. Everlasting life. I'll say it one more time. It is receiving everlasting life. Which means what it says. If it isn't forever, then it cannot be everlasting. Folks, we are in love going to war on this issue. Okay? This has to be stated clearly and boldly and accurately according to Scripture. God provides salvation, not probation. All right? Salvation, not probation. I, I, I heard a while back, uh, and he's a likable man. He's, he's, he's a very popular pastor of one of the... Uh, Calvary Chapels out in uh, West, and uh, he was asked the question, do you believe um, in eternal security? That's what he was asked. Do you believe in eternal security? And he said this, really bothered me as a pastor. He said this with very carefully crafted words. He said he is, he believes in eternally, eternal security. And he says, I believe I'm secure in Christ. And he says this, he said, he is secure in Christ as long as he abides in Christ. He's secure in Christ. Now, you know what? For the naive ear, you may hear that and say, oh, great. He believes in eternal security. He doesn't. He doesn't believe in eternal security. Because he said that he has to do something to stay saved. To abide in Christ is to remain in a given place. It is up to you to abide in Christ. Jesus said that to his disciples in John 15. And he wasn't talking about staying saved. He was talking about being fruitful as a Christian. Abiding in Christ has to do with you being fruitful, producing life in your, in your Christian life. It doesn't have to do with staying saved. This is serious. And so you have masses of people who are confused about this issue, as is this local pastor who's being promoted locally as well. Look with me. I had you turn to John 3.16. Question today. How many of you, hand raised, how many of you were saved on John 3.16? Okay, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. At least 22 in the room right now, John 3.16. By the way, that's a lot of people. 
Okay, for those of you watching, our numbers are down today. Just wanted you to know. <laughs> but anyways, that's a lot of people. You could get saved on any verse on salvation if you believe, right? John 3.16, look at it together. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave, this is Jesus speaking, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, referring to himself, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. God sent his son, Jesus, for a reason that we know he came to die and pay for our sins. And he did that. He was buried and he rose from the grave three days later. And he says, if you will believe in him, put your faith in him that he did that for you, he will give you everlasting life. Life, life that lasts forever, everlasting, lasting ever, okay? Never stops. If it stopped, it wouldn't be everlasting. If you didn't, if you failed to do something and it stopped, then it wouldn't be everlasting. We understand that. So what is salvation? It means to be delivered. In, in a biblical idea, it is deliverance in, in a context of, of getting saved. It's deliverance from hell forever to heaven forever. From a place of torment and awfulness to a place of wonder and joy. How? By simply putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So that leads us to our second point. How does a person obtain salvation? Is it through faithfully living according to God's principles of morality? No. Is it by keeping his commandments? Is it through struggling to live a godly life in an ungodly world? Is it through being a Christ follower? Is it through hard work, good deeds, and perseverance? Is it through sacraments? Is it through ordinances? Well, the Bible is abundantly clear on this issue. The Bible is abundantly clear. Eternal salvation is only obtained by believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not part of the way, it's the only way. And this is where there is so much controversy today. It is only by faith. I will prove that to you as we go through the text today. It is believing the message of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Christ died for our sins and rose again. He made the complete payment for all of our sins for all time. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, Paul's writing to believers, I declare unto you the gospel. I declare unto you the good news. The word gospel means good news. Jump down to verse 3, he defines it here. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel. That's the good news. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You might say, okay, that's the gospel. What am I supposed to do with that? You are supposed to believe it for you. You believe it for yourself. And when you do, God will give you everlasting life. I want you to see this. Turn with me now. Now, we understand the gospel's been defined, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Here's what, how, how we respond to it. Romans chapter 1. I want you to see what Romans 1 says. I also want you to see what Romans 1 doesn't say. Because this is where the controversies come in. Romans 1, verse 16, it says this. Paul, again, it's Paul. He says, I am not ashamed, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. Okay? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, that message, that good news about what Christ did for us, for it is the power of God unto, there's our word, salvation to everyone that what? Believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, Notice in verse 16, let me misread it a few different ways. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth and is sorry for their sins. Does it say that? No. To everyone that, uh, the, the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth and turns from all their sins. Does it say that? No. To everyone that believeth and promises to follow God the rest of their life. Does it say that? No. Now, by the way, all those other things are good to do. But they don't bring salvation. There's only one thing that brings salvation. It is faith in Christ. Faith is the noun form of believe, which is the verb form. Pistuo or pistos, uh, the various Greek forms of the word there. Let me show you what Jesus said. Not that what Jesus said is going to be different from what Paul said because they are in full agreement. Turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Pastor, how can you be sure that, and I hate this term, but I'll use it because this is the way people talk. You're right and they're wrong. Number one, it doesn't matter if I'm right in that sense of comparing with somebody else. What matters is what does God say. And that we need to believe and side with what God says. This is not a popularity context. This is not a democratic vote. How many of you agree with Pastor Kukuz and Yankee Arnold? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. How many of you agree with John MacArthur? Uh, Oh, there's more. Oh, MacArthur wins. No. Has nothing to do with that. Okay? Folks, listen, has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is what did Jesus say? And if the entire human race disagrees with God, the entire human race is wrong. God is always right because he's God. Okay? I don't, I, I don't mean to belabor this into the ground, but it's important that you understand that this is the issue of the day. So Romans 1 says, the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Okay, Here's Jesus in John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Path means possesses right now, everlasting life. How do you receive everlasting life? Remember, everlasting life is everlasting. It cannot stop. If it ever stopped, it wouldn't be everlasting. How do you receive it? By believing on Jesus Christ, putting your faith in him. Here's the question this morning. Is this true or not? Is it true? It is true. Jesus said it. Can he lie? Can he deceive? No. If it is true, if it is true, then it is enough. Please get this today. If it is true, then it is enough. Because if it is not enough, he didn't tell the truth. And I'll go further. If he didn't tell the truth, he's not God. And if he's not God, he can't save you. Because if he's not God, he was just a man. And if he was just a man, he was a sinner. And if he was a sinner, he had his own sin to pay for. This is huge. Okay? 
I said, what about all those other verses, this or that? No, this is the foundation. This is where it begins. There's, there's simple, easy explanations for these other things, if you understand the context. But Jesus said, if we will believe on him, put our trust in him, he will give us the moment we do everlasting life. I haven't included this verse, but I think of Philippian jailer, Acts 16. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas could have told them anything. What did they tell them? The same thing Jesus did. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Okay? Well, yeah, but he was baptized. Yeah, after he believed, he was baptized. We believe you should be baptized after you believe. But that baptism doesn't save you. It's a testimony that you've been saved. Here's the point. Scriptures agree. It is faith in Christ that brings salvation and only faith in Christ that brings it. Is this true or not? It is true. Here's the point, folks. If we, if we are helpless to save ourselves, and that's what the Bible teaches, then it must be by faith. Because there's nothing we can bring to the table. And if we add something to faith, we're disagreeing with what Jesus said. We're disagreeing with what Paul said. We're disagreeing with what John said. We're disagreeing with what Peter said. This pastor this week that I heard, he said, basically, I think he was referring to our position, although he didn't specifically say it, that it was easy believism. His point was that there's more to it than just believing. There's also being sorry and then following the Lord with your life. Okay? Easy believism. Question, what is it, hard believism? And what is that? The Bible says it is not based on man's works, man's faithfulness, or man's performance in any way. I got a question for you today just on a personal human level. If God loves us and he doesn't want us to go to hell, why would he make it hard for us to go to heaven? Look with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I know we often quote these verses, and rightfully we should, and we will continue. But we're going to break it down and let us see why this all makes such sense, this salvation that God provides. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, these are the two verses that I got saved on. I didn't get saved on John 3.16, sorry. It says this, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is the noun form of belief. Okay? For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That is a key concept. It is salvation is the gift of God. Not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Works have to do with how you live your life, okay? How you conduct yourself, that's your works, okay? For me to, to, uh, uh, to try to turn from my sins, that's going to involve work, okay? Um, any of these, following Christ, that's going to involve work, that's going to involve sacrifice. If you add that to faith, you are creating something that cannot bring salvation, because you never will be able to do enough. How much do you have to do if you have to do? If you have to, uh, let me ask you this. People say, well, you have to re re repent of your sin. Almost every time when they say repent, they mean turn from sin or be sorry for your sin. Okay? I got a question. Anybody who says that, I got a question. Have you turned from all your sin? No one has. It'd be great if we could. Get rid of all the sin. Wouldn't it be great when you get saved, you sin no more? Wow, that'd be awesome. 
But that's not the way it is. We still do sin as believers. No, that's not what it means. Repent means to change your attitude or to change your mind. That's what it means. Now, no one will ever get saved until they understand they can't save themselves. Because we instinctively think we can save ourselves by doing good works of one kind or another. That's, that's normal. Did you know every child? Listen, every child. You talk to them when they're little. Virtually every child believes that you go to heaven by being good. That's human nature. But it's wrong. They have to understand. They stand guilty before God, and adults have to understand this too, and everybody in between. We stand guilty before God. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And if God doesn't do it, we're going to end up in hell forever. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing you can add to what Jesus Christ has done. And so anybody who adds anything to faith, it's a problem. When you understand you can't save yourself, guess what you've done? You've changed your thinking. You've repented. The word repent, it's a compound word. Meta, another, noeo, mind, to have another mind. That's literally what it means. To have another mind. To think differently. And when you understand you can't save yourself and that Jesus died to pay for all your sins, you put your faith in him, you've repented. You've repented. But when you start saying repent means turn from your sins or be sorry for your sins or reform your life, those are all forms of works for salvation. You're not saved by works. You can't save yourself, as we're going to see. All right. For by grace are you saved. Let's break this down. Grace is unmerited favor or kindness. It is not something we deserve because of something we do. Pretty much everybody agrees with that who understands any Bible. Okay? Grace is unmerited favor. Now, you've got the Catholics who come in. They say, well, grace... Well, and by the way, a lot of people believe this. Calvinists even believe this. Okay? God gives you grace so you can perform and work your way to heaven. Okay? That has to do with the perseverance of the saints, they call it. No, that's perseverance of the saints is just code for works for salvation. All right? One uh, Bible dictionary says this, Grace is a favor done without expectation of return. The absolutely free expression of the loving kindness of God to men, finding its only motive in in its bounty, or in the bounty and benevolence of the giver, capital G. Unearned and unmerited favor. Unearned and unmerited If you can merit it, it's not grace. Grace is undeserved. It's unmerited. So if you need to do something to be saved, it's no longer grace. And you're only saved by grace. So you can't do anything to earn it. It's not Jesus and you It's Jesus who's the Savior. Understand this. God's justice and holiness had to be satisfied. We are sinners. Therefore, we can't do it. And our sins had to be paid for. Jesus paid the price on the cross by shedding his blood and making the full payment necessary to provide eternal life as a gift gift to man. Make no mistake about it, a terrible price had to be paid for our sins. Terrible. It cost God, his only begotten son, on the cross who was sacrificed for us. That's a terrible cost. Don't call that cheap grace. That's a disgrace to say that. It's amazing grace what God has done for us. And we don't take it lightly 
Because without the grace of God, no one will ever go to heaven. It's only by grace. It's not grace and works. It's not grace and surrender. It's not grace and following. It's grace alone. Notice it doesn't say in Ephesians, for by grace and works you're saved. It's for by grace are you saved through faith. When Jesus died on the cross in John 19, 30, he said, it is finished. Means paid in full. If Jesus paid the price in full, then what is there for me to pay for? Nothing. Because he did it all. He said it is finished. The debt has been taken care of. The work has been done. He died as our substitute. He paid for our sins so that we would not have to. And three days later, he literally came back from the dead. And yes, that's good news and that's gospel. Okay, look up here. Represents you and me. This represents our sin. Here we are, we're all sinners. God loves us, he hates our sin. Our sin separates us from God. You can't go to heaven with your sin. To get to heaven, you have to be sinless in the eyes of God. None of us are. He says sin has to be paid for. We've sinned, we've violated God's laws. He says, you're guilty. You need a a payment for your sin. And he's the one who determines it, and it's death. Separation from God for all eternity. Not good works. Judge, what's the payment? What's the penalty? Death. Oh, what about if I wash your car for a month? Nope. What about if I pay you a little bit of cash after the court hearing? Nope. What about if I promise to never do it again? That's turned from sin. Nope. Come on, judge, give me a break. Nope. The wages of sin is death. But he says, you know what? I love you so much, I don't want you to die for your sin. And he sent his son to do it for us. This hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came into this world, the sinless son of God. And he went to the cross, friend. And when he died on the cross, remember what he said, it is finished, paid in full. And he was buried and he rose from the grave. And he says, if you will believe in him, trust in him that he did that for you, the moment you do, that payment's good on your behalf. He gives you everlasting life. He says, I'll never lose you, never cast you out. John 6, 37 through 39, by the way. John 10, 28. 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. 1 John 5, 13. John 3.16, John 1.12, John 20.31, you get the idea. This is important. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's the second point, through faith. When we simply believe or trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, as the one who paid for all of our sins, God saves us. This word faith is, again, the Greek word pistis, okay? And and it means to put your faith in or to trust in. When we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are depending upon him to save us. In the context of salvation, we need to believe what the Bible says about the payment Jesus made on our behalf. When we put our faith in him as our Savior, as the one who paid for our sins, He gives us eternal life. Next phrase, and that not of yourselves. See, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Salvation is not something that we achieve. It does not come from us. That would be contrary to grace by nature because grace is unmerited. We put our faith in Christ, and God is the one who does the saving and who did the work not us. Work had to be done for my salvation. No doubt about it. But the price was impossible for me to pay outside of spending forever in hell, and therefore it would never get fully paid. Jesus came, did it for me. 
and for you. And he says, put your faith in him. It's not of ourselves. That's why your works are of no value to God before you're saved. Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. Have nothing to offer him. Do we understand? Nothing to offer him. Let's move on. It is the gift of God. This is so important. The word gift simply means present. A present. Not present, I'm here. You know. Are you here today? Present. No, that's not. This means a gift like at Christmas time or birthday. It is the gift of God. It means a present. This could not be any clearer. The word gift here, by the way, in Ephesians 2.8, refers back to salvation. It does not refer back to faith. The Greek does not support that. But that's what the Calvinists teach. No, it's salvation. How do I know that? Comparing Scripture with Scripture, not only does the text make it clear, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's defined for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the word gift refers back to salvation. Gifts by nature are free. What do you do? You merely receive a gift. The gift has been bought and paid for by another person. And you merely receive it. This is salvation, biblical salvation. Paul makes it clear in Romans. Uh, let, me, let me show you this. I don't, I'm not sure folks how, how folks miss this, but turn with me to Romans 5. We've been religionized way too much. Is it a problem? Is that even a word? Romans 5. Look at this. And as you're turning there, let me hand, handle a, a uh, objection to what we believe. People say, well, if you believe that, you'll go out and live the life of a rebel. Well, you know what? Some people do, unfortunately. Can I tell you this? I lived a life one year after I was saved that was worse than before I was saved. But you know what happened? I responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life. And it got me back on track. Was I saved during that time? Yes. How do you know? Because the Bible says so. I have everlasting life. I knew I had everlasting life. I knew God was my Father. But He wasn't as close to me during that time in the sense of my experience. I knew something wasn't right, okay? But I was still saved. I never doubted my salvation. But you see, folks, it was the grace of God that brought me back to walk with him. Now, I had to respond to it, but it was God's grace. Romans 5 and verse 15, it says this. It's talking about salvation. It says, but not as the offense, so also is the, what? Free gift. Free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, that's Adam, much more the grace of God and the what? The gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, referring to Adam, so is the gift for the judgment was by one, Adam, to condemnation, as in Adam all die. But the, what? Free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, that was Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the, what? Gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. By the way, if you highlight or underline or circle words, the word gift, free gift through this passage is very enlightening to remind you when you get to Romans 5, 
how much emphasis God puts on the point that salvation is a gift. And not only that, but can I tell you this? I find it interesting here, twice in this passage, it says free gift. It is as if the Lord knew that some theologians down through the ages would try to def- redefine the word gift into something that it's not. So can I take a little liberty here? It's as if God is saying, because some of you thick-headed theologians can't understand normal language, I will even go further with the word gift, and I will say it's free. Now, all gifts are free, but God has to tell us that to get us through our thick skulls. And yet today, there are people who will say, well, it's a gift, but you have to live right. Then it's not a gift. Try that with your children at Christmas. Try that with anybody on their birthday. Therefore, the Bible clearly states the word free here. Again, folks, all gifts are free. All gifts are free. If it's not free, it's not a gift. But salvation is the gift of God. Now, is that true or isn't it true? Yes, it is. It is true. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How much clearer could it be? This is the way it is. Now, again, they say this is some sort of uh, those who oppose this cheap grace, but this is inventing a new theological concept. I call it a straw man. That's cheap grace. No, it's not. Well, that's license to sin. No, God never intended that to be the case. Folks, he wants us to understand, if we understand how sinful and wicked we are and that we deserve hell, that's what we deserve. And when we understand what Jesus has done for us, and we trust him as Savior, and we experience the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the new nature and all the blessings that come with salvation. Didn't you just have a a heart full of praise this morning when we were singing our songs today? I hope you did. Boy, I sure did. So grateful for what God has done for me. I I was like I was going to explode with joy for what God has done. That's not a license to sin. That's the joy of walking with Christ. Verse 9, Ephesians 2, 9, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. What are works? They're deeds. They're things you do. The Bible says salvation is not based on the things you do, okay? Somebody I was witnessing two years ago, Church of Christ, I said, what do you do with verse 9, not of works? He said, well, those are bad works. I think I actually said, come on, come on. Friends, it's not of works. It's by believing. If it's by believing, if you, remember going back to John 6, if you can be saved by believing in Christ when you do, he gives you that moment everlasting life, then it can't be by works. Because I already have it. People say, well, you have to, you have to live a life too to have eternal life. No, no, sorry, I don't. Why? Because I already have eternal life. You're telling me I have to do something else to get it? I already have it. Sorry. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. There will be no braggers in heaven. No braggers. Every person in heaven has gotten there by the grace of God and only by the grace of God. My heart breaks For those who are being led astray by a mixture gospel of grace and works, which is no gospel at all, at all, according to Paul, Galatians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. 
One last verse we're going to cover today. Look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, it says this. The clear distinction is made. Romans 4 verse 5. But to him that worketh not. Here's somebody who doesn't do anything to try to earn it. Doesn't do anything. But to him that worketh not, but instead believeth on him, Christ, that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Somebody doesn't do anything, but you believe in Christ. That's where you put your faith. Not in what you do, but in what he did for you. His faith is counted for righteousness. God sees that. God's looking for faith. When he sees faith, he says, I give you my righteousness. I give you eternal life. Do you see it today? This is so important. This is so important. We don't want people to go to hell. We want them to go to heaven. How in the world could it be wrong to agree with Jesus? Can't be wrong. He can't be wrong. And when you agree with him, he gives you eternal life. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? With every head bowed today and every eye closed, please no one looking around. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you, there is no other way to heaven but by Him. The only way you can escape an eternity in hell, I don't say that with pleasure. It's hard to say it, but it's true. The only way you can escape an eternity in hell is by trusting, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, believing He's paid for all your sins. When you do, friend, it is that great. It is that wonderful. The moment you do, he saves you forever. You are secure forever. Will you trust in Jesus Christ right now? Right where you sit. Those of you watching through live stream, will you trust in Jesus Christ right now? Your works cannot save you. Your sincerity will not save you. It's faith alone in Christ alone. You can be sincere and be sincerely wrong in what you believe. No, Jesus is where you need to put your trust. And if you'll trust in him, he will save you. Will you do it right now? God knows your thoughts. If you're here today in the service, and today you've trusted Christ as your Savior, could I have the privilege of praying for you? Just knowing that you did that, I'd like to pray for you. I won't call you out by name. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. And you don't have to do this, but would you just slip up your hand if today you trusted Christ? Say, would you pray for me, Pastor, today I trusted Christ? Just slip it up, put it down. I'd love to pray for you. God bless you, dear friend. God bless you. Amen. You can put it down. Thank you for that. Is there anyone else? Glad you understand. Is there anyone else? Just slip it up, put it down. Say, would you pray for me, today I trusted Christ? Is there anyone else? Those of you watching over the internet, please, friend, will you trust in Jesus Christ right now as your Savior? He's the only way. He's the only way. Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for those who indicated today that they put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. We know, Father, that you save anyone who puts their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ. And you save them forever, and all their sins are forgiven. You paid for all sin, past, present, and future, by the death of Christ. And all who trust in Christ will never be lost again. Thank you for that. I pray that we will continue to grow, to learn your word, apply it to life as believers. Thank you, Father, for this time together today, and all your blessings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? 
To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and God bless you.